Okay, let's get our window up. Okay, hi everyone. We are almost a full group. Susan is on her way. I'm Jessica Buck, Adult Services Librarian. And I'm so happy to welcome you to the Escondido Public Library Virtual Author Chat Series. The series is sponsored by the Friends of the Escondido Public Library and in partnership with the Ripped Bodice Bookstore. In this series, we'll be talking to authors of all genres and covering topics from diversity and representation to the world of publishing and writing. Today, we'll be starting off with my personal favorite genre, romance. And today I'm joined by one of two authors that need no introduction, Jay Ann Krenz. And pretty soon we will have Susan with us. Let me just go make sure that she's not waiting. Yes, she is, okay. There were some technical difficulties, but she's here. Well, thank you for joining us, Susan. Jeez, we waved around for you. <laughs> I do not need this hassle after what I've been through. I, you so know, I, I, tr I tried another computer. It was messed up. But on the other hand, I got finally have a new outfit to wear. So there you go. It's a great outfit, in, and you made a great entrance. <laughs> we're thrilled to have you. Hi, Jessica. Hi. <laughs> Oh, Zoom. You know, I slept for nine hours last night and I, I'd done a yoga practice, but nothing strenuous. I think all these Zoom events are starting to catch up with me. Actually, I saw an article on it in the paper the other day that there's actually a syndrome of Zoom fatigue. I, I think I've got it. So what have I missed? Did she tell any stories about me or say anything bad? No, we were just getting no. to discuss you, but we didn't get there, unfortunately. Yes. So. I'm about to introduce you both. Okay. <laughs> Even we, though you yeah. need no introduction, I wrote it out, so I'm going to say it. <laughs> okay. So we have Susan Elizabeth Phillips, known as the Queen of Sports Romance. She is a New York Times, Publishers Weekly, and USA Today bestselling author, known for her lighthearted, sparkling, and addictive contemporary romance novels, which include the Chicago Star series, the Why Not Texas series, and multiple standalone books. She has published more than 20 books, including, oh, and this is her newest one. Cancel A with me. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> That's not fair. I don't have a, I don't have a copy. We'll, we'll oh, pretend. One, promise. <laughs> okay, her part, your novels have been published in more than 30 languages and appear on bestseller lists worldwide. And our other wonderful author has joined us today, Jane Ann Krentz, author of a string of New York Times bestsellers. She uses three different pen names for each of her three worlds. As Jane Ann Krentz, she writes, <laughs> because one isn't enough when you're too amazing. She writes contemporary romance suspense. As Amanda Quick, she writes historical romantic suspense and Jane Castle, is reserved for her special stories of futuristic paranormal romantic suspense. Whatever. <laughs> but wait, there's more. In addition to her fiction writing, she is the editor of and a contributor to a nonfiction essay collection, Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women, Romance Writers on the Appeal of the Romance, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Her commitment to her chosen genre has been strong from the very beginning of her career. This is my favorite part. She earned a BA in history from the University of California at Santa Cruz and went to obtain a master's degree in library science from SJSU in California. <laughs> yeah, but she's not in California now, and I am. I'm in <laughs> California, only a few miles away from all my friends in Escondido. She's up in Washington State. What the heck? Far away, yeah. But I would like to add that Susan was also in Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women, contributed an essay to it. Jessica, before this interview's over, this is one thing we haven't talked about in a while. And add that to the agenda, because that's okay. a real interesting story, OK? Oh. OK. Yeah, no, please ask us about that for a while, Jane. About the Dangerous Men? Yeah, Dangerous Men, Adventurous Women. 
I haven't talked about it in a long time. Well, it's an old book now. I hate to say it, but it's, I, I'm amazed it's still in print. It's been in the 90s, I think. And it, and yeah. the, the beauty of it, I guess, is that it was after that was published that it sort of became okay to research and study the genre, the romance genre, with the same respect that they were at the time giving mysteries and science fiction. But romance had never achieved that level of respect within the academy. So the trick was to publish a book by an academic press. That was the only way it was ever going to get respect. Yeah. Um, let, me, I guess let me tell the story from my viewpoint looking in, because <laughs> Jane was the guiding force. She was the goddess of this thing. What happened was there were some studies coming out of academia that were half-baked and misleading. And we were getting really fed up about it. But while the rest of us just complained about it, Jane took action. And she was very thoughtful and very strategic about this. Do not estimate her just because she's little and cute. She decided <laughs> that what we needed to do was to define the genre for ourselves from inside, get this book of essays published by an academic press because once it was published, then any academics who wrote about the genre had to reference it. It turned, it's an old book now, but it not only did it make writing about romance in the Academy uh, respectable, but it released a floodgate of work uh, in uh, the academic world. It, I mean, it was just a brainstorm. The rest of us were just her accolades. We followed along and did what she said. <laughs> Well, the worst part was editing 19 other writers. Oh, Let yeah. Me... <laughs> I remember <laughs> that. I will, I will never, ever do an academic book again. That was it. I'm out of there. It's, <laughs> that's a tough were world. Were there 20 of us? Were there 20 of us who participated in that? Something like that. Yeah. And um, so our literary agent handled all this. So anytime a royalty check comes in, and now the royalty checks are like oh. $18, he has to split it 20 ways. <laughs> It's been, a, it's been a nightmare for him, yeah. yeah it has been. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, so that's that. So that's the story of Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women. And that book was required reading in a lot of uh, undergraduate and graduate level courses on popular fiction because it was all there was. That's awesome. I'm so happy that that got asked. <laughs> I, I told you Susan's a great interviewer. <laughs> You, you didn't really think you were going to take control of this interview, did you, Jessica? And you were warned. <laughs> I was warned. That's why I only sent you guys five questions. <laughs> I didn't I see them. Were they? <laughs> I did not see them. Okay. Well, let me ask the first one, and then you guys yeah. can An actual question. talk whatever you want to talk about. So, when did you first start reading romance? And what inspired you to, to go from a reader of romance to a writer and creator of romantic stories? There. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I, you know, I sort of trace it back to my love of those Walter Farley horse books. So there was something about the relationship between the horse and the little kid in those stories that I, looking back was really very romantic. And, and then it went to Nancy Drew, which I consider my formative. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, I knew that you loved to read the horse stories, but I wasn't prepared for that connection. Just <laughs> go, ahead, go back to where you were. <laughs> horse stories. Well, it's the, it was that mystical bond between the horse and the, and the little hero kid, which was always a boy, but I just wrote him out of the script. and Just myself. makes you think about Mr. Ed. <laughs> Wilbur. <laughs> No, my horse, those, these horse stories were always glorious horses, very handsome horses. Um, and always male, come to think of it. <laughs> um, and then Nancy Drew, and then some early science fiction, um, Andre Norton and the early Robert Heinlein. But the book that probably actually changed my life and made me want, made, made me start reading a lot of romance. Um, and then later, became the model I wanted to write was a book called Restore, like Restore, Restore, and it was by Anne McCaffrey. 
And I'm sure it never, nearly killed her career because she never did another one like it. <laughs> she, she moved from there into Dragons right away. Um, so this, but it was, it was the quintessential futuristic romance. So I set out to write futuristic romance first. And back in those days, you just, you couldn't sell it. So, so then I transitioned to contemporary romance. That's how I got going. And that was back in, that was after college, actually. That was after uh, I'd been working in the library world for a while. How uh, many manuscripts did you, do you think you uh, wrote before you got one published? I actually don't know the answer to this. I have no idea because I wrote so many, remember in those days it would be three chapters and a cover letter? Yes, I yeah. I got a lot of three chapters <laughs> with no book. <laughs> Is that what you eventually sold on three chapters and like a, a cover? Yeah, cover letter. Yeah, um, to a small romance publishing house that was, I think, a mafia front, but <laughs> <laughs> they published my books. I didn't ask too many questions. And that was under a fourth name, wasn't it? Wasn't oh, that under your yeah. first pseudonym? Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. I well, I got the floor. I will just say if there are any aspiring writers out there, the one the one message, the one word I would give you today is whatever you do, don't use multiple pen names. <laughs> Stick with one name. Yeah, well, I disagree with Jane about this. We talked about this one before. And the reason, and I'm right about this, what the brilliance is of having these three names, the Krentz, the Castle, and the Quick name is she can write different, it's the same voice, but she's writing in these different worlds. And some readers who will read her in one world won't read her in another. Some will read her across the board, but it does let readers be a little choosy in terms of what they want to read. And I think overall that it's really benefited her career. That's just my take. Well, it, it does have the advantage of letting me identify the worlds. And I, when I first started out, I don't think I realized how important that was to readers, how it, and, and I, it's easier to see sometimes if you look at the mystery genre where there's um, British style police procedurals and there's American style police procedurals and there's cozies and there's the village mystery and there's the thriller and there's the serial killer. I mean, there's a dozen kind of worlds under the mystery genre. Um, and my tip of the day for that, for the readers who read police procedurals is that the difference between the American police procedural and the British police procedural is that in the British police procedural, the cops are usually the good guys. Mm. That dirty cop story is an American story. And I find that fascinating. I just- Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah, I just find that really that. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Off mm. topic, moving back, to, moving back to Susan. This, I gotta ask myself because I know that this book of yours, which I just happen to have a copy of right here, <laughs> and I knew you You felt you. We talked a lot while you were writing this book, and you said it felt a little different for you. It yeah. was your voice, but something was different. And, and so, what was that for you? What was that experience? You know, um, readers love my Chicago Stars books and the Wynette Texas books. And there are certain readers I have who would like it if that's all I wrote. Those books tend to be uh, romantic comedies generally. They're sort of romps. Um, and I love writing them. But I've always said I won't write another Chicago, Chicago Stars books. I love those books. I won't write another unless I have the perfect story. And in the meantime, these other ideas are coming to me. So I do these standalone books. And um, they're, they always have humor in them, but they may be a little bit more serious. This uh, Dance Away With Me is probably my angstiest book. Um, at the same time, the one, uh, th there's a lot of emotion in this book. There's still humor. Uh, this book kind of walks that line between romance and women's fiction. And this is a line I love writing and I love reading. Uh, where you have a strong love story, but you also have these stories of community and family and girlfriends and you've got teenagers popping up and, and a really crazy town with a lot of crazy people. I, I just love reading that. Uh, but on the other hand, the one contract I will never break with readers is always a happy ending. I don't want to torture my readers when the book is done. I want them to, to feel good. My motto always is, and I think Jane shares this, life is too short for depressing books. Mm -hmm. 
So, so would you just define that as the dividing line then between women's fiction or literary fiction and and romance? Um, I think that this whole uh, women's fiction is such a huge umbrella for for everything, and some women's fiction tends to be very literary, and some of it's very depressing, and some is what we call chick lit or mommy lit, and I don't have any trouble with that because I love reading books in all those genres. But the relationship between girlfriends may be in many of those more important than the hero heroine relationship, and in my books, the, the basic relationship is still going to be the hero heroine. Yeah, I get that. I agree. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, I've actually been talking about close up your last Amanda Quick a lot in some of the interviews I've been doing, because sometimes, oh, and uh, mine's on my Kindle, so I can't hold it up. So now I feel like a bad friend. Uh, but the thing I find interesting is Jane loves writing in the paranormal, and she does it with different degrees of intensity. What I love about Close Up, I mean, it's classic Krentz. You have Lee, you have um, a hero and heroine, Vivian and Nick, who are both admirable people. Uh, she she uh, has they've got some rough edges to them, but they're they are an admirable hero and heroine. Um, and in this book, she does what I like, which is kind of light paranormal. She doesn't take us into a completely different world like she'll do with Jane Castle, but we've got just this other element, these characters who rely on instinct. I love that. And the other thing while I'm talking about close up that I love that I've already, it's so much fun to be able to email your friend when you're reading her book. Um, the, this world of the 30s, that she, 1930s, that she's entered the thin man world with um, these books is such a great landscape for her to write in. And uh, I love the whole bit. Well, I'll just say Charles Atlas to anybody who's read it. And <laughs> I won't say any more, no spoilers. But I, I love this world she took us into. So Jane, talk a little bit about, I know the answer to this, but I think it's really interesting. Why you decided to go into the 1930s? You're a pioneer in, in taking um, <laughs> women's fiction romance into that area. Nobody's been doing it since, you know, the 40s. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, maybe I should just let you keep talking. You're doing a really good job of selling that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, when I first started out writing Regencies, the Regency As world, Amanda Quick. As Amanda Quick. Right. The Regency world appealed to me because of the sparkly dialogue, the kind of back and forthy thing. There was a world in place there that people recognized because of, well, George Ed Heyer. They had been reading Regency romance, what, for, she, I think she started in the 30s, and people knew that world, and here in America, people knew that world because there were just, a, you know, it was a world that had already been brought into existence. So when I decided to shift out of the 19th century, I'm already back in the 20th century, and I there didn't feel... I didn't feel a zone there that that fit those kind my kinds of characters, except the contemporary zone, which is I, I was already writing in the 21st century. And most of the 20th century isn't all that appealing to me. I just, I, maybe mm -hmm. I live too much of it. <laughs> um, but I had an interesting conversation with my editor when I said I was going to give up the Amanda Quick writing. And wait a minute, just let's get this clear. It's not that you were getting ready to give up, Amanda. It's you were going to kill her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, picked, I didn't even let that happen. Go ahead. There was a lot of shouting from Chicago. That's where Susan lives. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, you can't do that. Um, anyhow, long story short, I think my editor said, well, what about the 1920s first? And I said, no. For one thing, it's... I, I don't know what it is about the 20s. It just doesn't, I, I, I can enjoy reading a book set in that world, but it doesn't draw me for some reason. Um, and then, so she kept moving forward. We hit the 30s. <laughs> and as soon as she said that, I said, oh yeah, that works. And, and the reason was because that's a pre-existing world too. Everybody knows it. Everybody recognizes it from the films and from the golden age of Hollywood. Even if you, none of us lived in that era, we were all born after that, but we all know it. That's how iconic it has become. Um, 
And when you have that preset world and it's got the sparkly dialogue from the movies, it's got all kinds of uh, things going on, gangsters and movie stars and you know all, all the rigmarole. And then I realized that the place that I needed to write about was California in the 30s mm -hmm. because it was such a distinctive world. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I didn't have to, I don't have to explain everything to everybody because they've seen those cars They've seen, they've seen those Hollywood studios. They get, all you have to do is say, and since I don't do description well, it's really good for me to be able to say, Hollywood studio. <laughs> and thus Amanda's life was saved. <laughs> but you really, I, you know, I can get why you wanted to move out of the Regency. You know, it, after a while, you want a fresh playground. And I think that, uh, that these QuickBooks gave you that, that, that new playground and uh, just kind of refreshed everything in your head and gave you a new world to play in. So I'm glad. You, you, on your book, do you think you'll write more in this, in this new vein with the closer? Uh, I think, I really, really love these community stories. I love having this, th these wacky people in this neighborhood. And I love, you know, I love writing my heroes with, they've got edges to them. These are not perfect beta guys that you necessarily would want to be married to. Um, and my heroines, Jenny Cruzy used to say that I torture my heroines more than anybody, but I love at the beginning of the book to take a care, uh, the heroine's support structure and just rip it out from under her. So she really, the story, her whole book has to be her journey. So in, in um, Dance Away With Me, Tess is a midwife She's also a grieving young widow. She's come to this little town above, uh, this little rustic log cabin above the town of Tempest, Tennessee. All she wants is to be left alone. While our hero, Ian Hamilton North, is a America's most famous street artist. And that was a whole new area that opened up to me, being able to research street art. He's the American equivalent of the great British street artist, Banksy. Uh, but he's at a he's at a tumultuous time in his career, and all he wants is to be left alone. So you have these characters who both the last thing in the world they want to have to do is work together, and something else comes along that, of course, makes them have to work together. It's just a story I love telling in lots of forms. I love, I, I really like that whole idea of enemies to friends, uh, to lovers. It, it's something that I never get tired of reading about. So that's that's kind of where I am, and and I I find that um, you know if I get another idea for a great stars book, I will write another stars book. Um, but I love being able, I love the fact that my readers will follow me into these different kinds of books, into the standalones and into the series books. Well, it's the voice, they, you know, readers are following the voice. Yeah, and every every author has a voice. Yeah, and no two are the same. It's in a interesting phenomenon but I've always said that I think if you're drawn to an author's books again and again um, especially in the women's fiction genre I think if you come back you may enjoy one interesting author that shocks you one time or one interesting author that writes particularly good sexy you know erotica or you know something that someone does really good thrillers or something but if you go back to that author again and again and it becomes a favorite, I, it becomes a favorite, it, she becomes a favorite. I think it's because something in her core values resonates with your core values. Mm -hmm. I do not think we continue to read people who really violate our own inner sense of what's right and what's wrong. One time, maybe it's shock, but it, yeah. you go for the shock value or the horror of it, but it's not a beloved author that you're going to want to read every book they wrote and yeah i have a hard time entering a book where i can't find it my my son and i he's a big reader he reads a lot more literary fiction than i do but um he can easily enter a book where there's no sympathetic character to enter through and i just can't i have to have that sympathetic character go in so he's obviously wrong obviously you raised him wrong yep <laughs> Uh, Jessica, is there anything, I, I know we haven't given you a chance, would you like to ask us anything? <laughs> Let me see if you haven't already answered some of the questions that I had. Um, 
Okay. Well, here, okay, here's one. What is important for you to have in the books you write? So what do you want the readers to come away with after they've read your story? Oh, that's great. I want the readers to have made new friends. And I love that when you're done with the book and you know, you're falling asleep at night and you're thinking about the characters and you're imagining what happened to them after the book uh, ended and you're thinking about them the next day. I love, that's what I wanna leave my readers with. Uh, the feeling that they wanna know more about the characters and they'd like to have these characters in their lives. Aww. That's kind of where I am with it. Jane, what about you? Um, some, some, what she said. <laughs> You know, the greatest compliment I get is when somebody says they reread my books. Yeah. And it, for those who find them rewarding enough or satisfying enough or get something out of them that makes them want to go back to those books, I'm getting a lot of that now during the crisis. I'm getting a lot of people writing and saying, I'm pulling out all my books. I, and I know Susan's getting the same kind of feedback it's, it's kind of safe territory to be reading it. It's com we use the term comfort read, but that's mm -hmm. a good term. You know, it, it, this is a time when that kind of reading is therapeutic. So. It, it's so true. We've all, those of us who've been around for a while are getting tons of email from readers now saying they're rereading. I think for a lot of readers, they want because everything is so unsettled now, they want to go into a, a safe space, a space where there's order mm -hmm. and where they know that justice is going to triumph. The bad guy's going to get caught. The lovers are going to be together. It is a world, an orderly world in a time of chaos. And uh, I think we're, we're really, really seeing that now with rereading. And, and I want to do the same thing. I don't want to be taken into a incredibly unsettled, uh, unstable world right now. Yeah, it may not be the best time to be writing dystopian fiction. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, for, for us, it wouldn't, Jane. We'd have nervous breakdown. But <laughs> I think for uh, some readers do want to go into that dystopian world because if it's good fiction, there is going to be a sense of order by the end. That's true. Uh, but that's awesome. just, you and I are kind of um, weenies. Wimps, wimps, yeah. yeah. We don't want to be too, yeah. we don't want to cry all the way through and then get to the end. And <laughs> uh, Yeah. And then, it, it, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> yeah. No, it's an interest. It's, it, it'd be interesting to know what is selling right now. What do you see, Jessica, what do you see being checked out of the library? What's any cotton patterns? Any trends? Well, I mean, right now it's a lot of the, in terms of nonfiction, it's a lot of the like anti-racism books that we have. Those are really big. I haven't checked to see what, what our high demands are because we just started curbside. Ah. So it's mostly the, the digital that's being checked out in large quantities. But it's usually the, the happy books. <laughs> <laughs> the um, New York Times bestseller list was fascinating this week. Um, it was what the top 15 slots, I think almost every single one dealt with racism or um, African American lives in some way. So readers and peep citizens want to be informed. And this lets me have a little chance to get on my soapbox. There's th there have been a lot of slings and arrows uh, directed at the publishing industry lately for a lack of diversity in their authors. And I think some publishers deserve it, but I also think some publishers don't. There are some publishers who I think are doing a great job of presenting diverse authors. And what this makes me think about is reader's responsibility. As are you as a reader interested, are you willing to go into a different kind of world? Uh, just a couple of examples. Beverly Jenkins has been writing for years. She's one of the top African-American um, romance writers, just one of the top romance writers, period. And she's created the series, The Blessing series, where she takes you into this fabulous community. One book after another, you get to know the people. And I keep thinking, what if a reader realizes this is an African-American writer writing about this, um, this fictional African-American community and think they don't want to go there? 
No, readers have a responsibility too. We have to get out of our comfort zone and, and broaden, broaden the worlds we go into. My friend Sonali Deb writes these fabulous books uh, from, you know, Sonali? From yes, the, we're going to have her here next week. Oh, you're going to love her. You're going to love her. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> she, she and I only live a mile apart, but, but she takes readers into what it's like to be Indian in the United States. And she's doing like a series of Jane Austen yes. uh, ripoffs right now. <laughs> uh, so as a reader, let's, let's broaden our horizons too, and not just be pointing fingers at the publishing houses. Let's, let's go into some of these fabulous worlds. Second that, I second that. It's as a reader, you have to, you have to. It isn't a question of challenging yourself. It's just, oh. it's just a question of you try a new movie on, on TV. You know, you try a new series on TV. Give some of these other worlds a chance. You're gonna be thrilled. I guarantee you. It's. it's I love that. I mean, I just love books that open a new world to me. Yeah. That one of my remember uh, when, when this isn't this isn't a diverse author, but it just reminds me. Remember when Memoirs of a Geisha came yes. out? I was just thinking that, that was just an example of one of those early books long ago that you're just like, whoa, what is this about? And it opened up this whole new world. This fascinating world. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I agree. Okay, you get another chance, Jessica. This <laughs> jump. Okay. Do you have a favorite romance novel or one that has a has had a particular impact on you? Well, I did I did answer that one earlier when I said that for me it was uh, that Anne McCaffrey futuristic romance, which she never wrote another one. <laughs> okay, you're off the hook. <laughs> um, for me, definitely the so-called bodice rippers of the late 1970s and, and the uh, 1980s. The term bodice ripper has been thrown at the romance genre until we're just ready to gag on it. In if, what, and it's, it's a, and I understand it's a term thrown out of ignorance. In fact, that reply, that applies to a very specific time from the late seventies into the early eighties when he had these very, very aggressive heroes and usually these very, very innocent heroines, but these innocent heroines managed by the end of the book to bring these tough guys to their knees. So the, this was a world that Kathleen Woodowis introduced us to Rosemary Rogers, Joanna Lindsay. Uh, and this was a world that, uh, I fell in love with these books like so many other readers do. So those books had a huge, huge influence uh, on me. Before that, an English writer named Catherine Cookson, the great Anya Seton, Mary Stewart. These were all just huge influences, uh, influences for me in terms of my reading. And th thinking about Mary Stewart, remember those gothics? The cover always had the heroine you're a little young for this, Jessica, but Jane and I remember the, the cover had um, a house on a hill. It was night. There was one light in the window. The heroine is in a negligee running away from the house. Okay. <laughs> that was on every Gothic novel. And oh, yep. love those books. Love them. So when I wrote Heroes Are My Weakness, which was two books ago, I wanted to take that story and put a contemporary spin on it, but with all those tropes of the old Gothics. Um, it was a challenge because older readers were going to know what I was doing. For younger readers, I had to just make it stand alone and make them love this world without having those cultural uh, literary references. Um, but anyway, those those books were a huge influence on me. Jane, did you read all those gothics too? You had to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they were the closest thing to romance we could get. Yeah. I mean, it really wasn't a genre out there that we would identify as straight romance. That was it. That was it. Um, and interestingly, it's kind of making, I think it's kind of making a comeback, the Gothic novel. I don't think it ever went away entirely, but the new version of it looks more like the old version in the sense of setting and place. Um, the Tess Gerritsen book, The Shape of Water, Shape of Night. Not, I always want to mix that up with the movie, The Shape of Water, but I think the title of the book is The Shape of Night. Uh -huh. And it's the old castle on the hill that's being refurbished you know and there's a ghost and and um and the woman running from a past and she's the only person in the house you know she rents the whole house she's going to write her book there um and it, it just pulls on all the all the classic gothic things including and spoiler alert here 
that you're never really sure there wasn't a ghost. She leaves, and I think that was the key. You never really, you always leave that thread hanging. You've got an explanation for what everything that happened during the storyline, the mystery. But when you walk away from the house, you look back and <laughs> was there a ghost, you know? And that, and now I've seen that now in a, um, two or three novels um, in recent, this past year alone. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's kind of a thing yeah. that come back. Well, we've seen, um, and, and that's not romance, but we have seen just the course of our careers, so much exploration happening in the romance genre. And I always love to quote Jane. Um, helicopter. Uh, Jane used to, used to say, there is so much, or always does still say, unless I interrupt her, that there is was always so much innovation in the romance novel because nobody was paying attention to us and we were flying under the genre. You had, remember time travel when that exploded and um, just, there is not a concept, an idea from werewolves to whatever that you can come up with that somebody in the romance genre hasn't explored it. It's the most innovative genre there is, all hands down. Yeah, yeah. it's just, you just don't run into the barriers that you do in say, I mean, mystery, for example, has some really strict, you can't do this, you know, or, or you, they won't buy the book. That's, those are, there's a lot of rules, not written down anywhere, but there's rules as far as the publishers and the readers are concerned. And they get very upset when those rules are violated. But the romance writer is willing to give it a shot and the romance reader is willing to give it a shot. And they may not come back to that book, but they'll try it. And if you do come up with something new, like vampire heroes, um or werewolves or or just a lot of interesting um there's a lot going on in the lgbtq community right now and i have a friend who writes in that community in that world and he had a tough time selling his books as a romance because everybody wanted a message book and he was writing a romance novel and it it and the world that accepted that book, that story was the romance market mm -hmm. before the gay um, publishing market. It, those people, those publishers would turn him down because it wasn't message driven, but the romance market bought it. And well, it's, yeah, it's growing. yeah, yeah. And then and, and, and that's that's another example. I mean, that's just a, another example of these subgenres that that there's there are readers that are hungry for everything. Yeah. So we have a Facebook question. What is your favorite book of each other's? <laughs> Always the last one. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. I was just I was just thinking that. The same way with close up. I really enjoyed that. And I and I also enjoyed the whole world of the heroine. This is not a spoiler in close up, is a photographer. And she has this battle between doing the commercial stuff, the the um, newspaper crime shots and the fact that she's an art photographer and I, I really love love that kind of crunch that she's in that creative crunch so that's my favorite one right now but I know she'll write another one and then that'll be my favorite <laughs> well let me just read you the first lines of Susan's book and then you get a sense of where this one is going Tess danced in the rain she danced in her underpants and an old tank top with her feet tucked into a sad pair of once silver ballet flats. I don't know. <laughs> past and She's future. dancing. She's trying to dance out all of her pain. Not the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Well, I liked I liked working with the close-up character just because it, I, it was kind of, an, I knew this, I knew that there had always been conflict in the art world between whether photography was a legitimate art form or whether it was just journalism in a pictorial form. And that conflict still goes on today. Um, but it can make or break a career to have had been, if, if you as an artist were tainted by doing work in the commercial world of photography, um, it could be really hard to break into the art world. So, so the heroine's who has identified a killer is now struggling to keep her crime photography secret. Secret. Yeah. 
And I would just like to add that there's a hired assassin, paid assassin, and that there is a psychic investigator, and there is a dog. <laughs> and I have sold more books based on the fact that there's a dog. There's in the a story. dog. <laughs> You know what? That's a great dog in that book too. I love that dog. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, you also kept me guessing. I I didn't figure it out, and I, I thought for sure I would get it, but I didn't. I didn't figure it out. And that kind of annoyed me. I have to say. <laughs> that I think the plot part I do to entertain myself. That's like it's a game. Yeah. Anybody who's on Facebook now, if there's something you specifically would like us to address let us know because we'll talk about just about anything. <laughs> we have two. Mm -hmm. One is who are your favorite heroines, your own and each other's? Mm -hmm. Think, well, it's the same thing as with the books. It's the last book, you know, the last. Right. <laughs> but yeah. I, I do like the fact that in both of us in our own very distinctive ways, because we have very different voices, but I do like the fact that we both are drawn to characters who have to reinvent themselves. Yeah. I mm -hmm. like that reinvention story. Yeah. And I don't have, I mean, you know, we're, we're frequently asked who our favorite, uh, you know, which our favorite character is, which our favorite book is. Favorite character, I, I don't have one. I mean, I, and I would feel disloyal naming one. And in terms of books, whatever book I have just finished is my favorite and whatever book I'm working on is the book that is my least favorite that's going to crash my career. That has been consistent <laughs> the course of 23 yeah. books. <laughs> same here, same here. It's, it's the one that's giving me the trouble now and the one that looks really good in hindsight was the one I just finished. It's like, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's nice when you've got a writing friend to be able to bounce things off because writers understand where you are. Jane was on a cruise one time and was calling me from the middle of the South China Sea or somewhere. That was so much fun to, and, and what was interesting about that phone call, Jane, I've thought about it since, is you knew exactly what you wanted to do, but you just, you didn't know, you know, you knew, but you didn't know, and you just needed an outside voice to say, are you crazy? Of course you should do that. <laughs> Sometimes that's what you need when you're a writer. You really lose sight of the forest for the trees, and you need to have somebody say to you, no, no, you're on the right track. It's just like, <sighs> Yeah, I think it's a case of tending to second guess yourself. And it's right. Like, and, and the second guessing gets you into more trouble. It, right. And Jane has helped me. Usually when I talk to Jane about a plot problem, I'll have a notepad and I, I, and I take notes on it. Um, and uh, actually, oh, one word, I, because I'm not talking about my next, pro, my next uh, project, Jane, I'll have to tell you something that you said that really helped me on the current one, but I'm not talking about it yet. Okay. <laughs> I know that's not fair. That's kind of nasty, but He's <laughs> it, Jane did steer me right on something. <laughs> Many things. It, it's just, there's nothing... We've got a long friendship, goes back a long years, and and we think a light a lot of things, and we we know each other's work so well. I think it's we we kind of know each other's strengths. And, and that's right. Yeah, and help get into it. Yeah, yeah, go back to your strength, and that's the oldest rule. I think in addition, to don't have lots of pen names. Um, <laughs> figure out what if if you're an aspiring writer, figure out what your strength is. What and play to that strength. Don't try to go in another direction because it's trendy. Find out what your source of power is and then just hone it. That's right. Yeah. I did a program for the Carlsbad Library talking about just a writing program um, for aspiring writers. And one of the things that I talked about in addition to that was the whole idea of it's not easy and the only way you do it is butt in chair. Uh, and the fact that when you're writing, it's hard and you have to be able to sit in your discomfort and work things out. Uh, that was one of many things I talked about, but it just sort of applying to what Jane is saying. Yeah, it is work. It is work. It's satisfying work, but it's work. Yeah. And Anything else work. coming in from Facebook? Yes. Let me, there's so many that I need to open it in its own window. <laughs> That's all right. Go ahead. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> Let me see all. Well, while I'm looking for, I know there was one about whether or not you're a panster or a planner. We're both pansters. Um, 
Jane plans a little more than I do, but that's not a big compliment. <laughs> <laughs> we both wish we were the other way, but it never works out for us. On the uh, pan, a panster, by the way, is somebody who doesn't have a really big outline, doesn't know exactly where their book is going, just kind of plunges in. Last night, I did um, a session with Susan Mallory, the yes. uh, terrific writer, and Susan is just the opposite. She has everything planned before she starts writing every scene. She's got her sequence. She has her structure all laid in. And so she says, all I have to do when I'm done is just write it. Uh, so the completely different process. But that's one of the things with writing. There is no right or wrong way. It depends on how your brain is wired. Yeah. And you just have to make peace with that. Yeah, there are no rules except write. It's just mm -hmm. work it out. Okay, here's another. Which of your books would you most like to see made into a film? <laughs> I feel like you could ask this one. Um, oh. the whole, for, a, for a long time, neither of us really had those aspirations. It, because it's such a different medium. And, and you recognize going in that it's, it's kind of probably not you're not a film writer. I'm not a film writer. You know, I just don't write that way. And you know what it looks like because it's very visual. Mm -hmm. um, things have changed a little bit, I think, lately because of the demand for content on all of these new channels, you know, the Netflix and the Amazon doing their own thing. Now, they'll look at stuff that Hollywood never would have considered. And there have been some interesting sales, some interesting deals done with romance in the past year mm -hmm. on you know places like netflix and stuff um we'll see where it goes it's okay. it's an interesting new world out there so if that were to happen i guess i would hope they would pick up a series just because uh, <laughs> i don't think one one netflix movie would sell one book but a series, <laughs> i can get on you I mean, it, it is amazing to me that your books haven't been picked up because they're just perfect. I mean, look at these Amanda Quick books, all this, the setting in the, the 30s, how visual that is. Um, I have, I'm, I'm the same, it, it, I, Jane and I agree on this. I didn't have much interest in feature film because whatever was on the screen wouldn't have been my book. And uh, Netflix is more interesting. You start with what happened with Diana Gabaldon and the Outlander series. Instead of trying to take that first book, for example, and make one movie out of it, it was a whole series. And uh, you really got it, it, and it was perfectly cast, which is also, how often does that happen? I mean, you know, it'd be my luck that, that uh, Hollywood would take one of my movies and cast Pete Davidson as my hero. Um, but, uh, you also have uh, Robin Carr's series, her Virgin River series is just going great. And Netflix has bought another series. Julia Quinn has the Bridgertons coming in. So oh, I, that, Chandra, I know Shonda Rhimes is doing that one. And I think that one's gonna be amazing. So that is intriguing, uh, but the feature film thing is, is not. So we're here, Netflix comes calling, you just, just to bring money, lots and lots of money. I didn't say that, Jane. You cut that out. Pretend like you didn't. It makes me seem way too greedy. So we have some technical questions like, how long does it take you to write a book? How much do you know about your main characters before you start writing? And do things change? Do you use a vision board? Those kind of questions. Never used a vision board. <laughs> I did use a Venn diagram once. That was I was pretty thrilled with myself on that. <laughs> That's just pitiful. <laughs> Actually, I've done that too. <laughs> um, I, one of the books was so complicated, I had to do a Venn diagram because I was losing track of the relationships. <laughs> well, I, re I remember uh, I was talking to Frank about it over the breakfast table, and I was sitting there with, with a yellow pad trying to figure out how all, what all these characters had in common that could put them at the scene at the right time, right? And it was, I, I was just going squirrely, trying to, trying to get it all right. And so Frank, the engineer says, well, do a Venn diagram. <laughs> and I said, that sounds like math. I don't do math. <laughs> but then he showed me the interlocking circles and 
bingo, you know, it really was. And if, so as tools go, that's the only exotic tool I've ever tried to use. Um, yeah. and, I know, and I know very little about the characters going in. Very the little. same with, with me. With my books, what always interests me, and I've spoken about this before, is all I have is just the stereotype, the stick figure going in. And it takes me almost consistently nine months to figure out who the character is. I just, that just blows my mind. I've seen it happen book after book. At that point, they start becoming a fully, fully developed character. My, um, the things I have to have to write, I have to have um, my fat pens and my yellow legal pad, although I write on the computer. Um, it's hard for me. I, my thoughts go in 13 different directions. So it, I really need the, to be able to brainstorm on the legal pad um, and uh, can't wear a bra cannot wear a bra when you write it will strangle all your creativity right out of you <laughs> trust me on that same here so i've heard a lot of writers say that <laughs> yeah first world writing take off your bra it's too much like a corset yeah yeah well you know more about that than i do <laughs> from the world you have written in <laughs> So we have two people asking if there are any future dust bunny books. Oh, oh those dust bunnies. I love those suckers. <laughs> Tell us. I, this is going to be on my tombstone. I can see it now. She wrote the dust bunny books. I <laughs> Tell them what the dust bunnies are for readers who are the unfortunate readers who aren't familiar with your work. Okay. I write them in my Jane Castle futuristic world. And this is on another planet with humans colonizing this other planet. And there's, creatures already existing on the planet and one of them is a dust bunny which is kind of like your perfect psychic pet this is like the perfect dog or the perfect horse you know that that just bonds with you and you you and the animal get along so they are of course absolutely adorable um but they're also lethal they're they've got teeth and um they they look a lot like an angora rabbit until they until you see the teeth and then it's too late. So the dust bunnies were a, a side thing in the first two books. And then they've just taken over. That's all anybody wants from those Jane Castle books. I, they don't care about my brilliant plots. They don't care about my spectacularly developed characters or all the, all the razzmatazz I've invented for this world. They just want the dang dust bunnies, more dust bunnies. It's like, ah! <laughs> And are we going to get more dust bunnies? Yep. I, 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 I came up with another story. So it, I'm going to finish writing it at the end of summer. And then, then I'll get, get them off my back for a while. <laughs> did the dust bunnies just occur to you out of, how did that, how did they come into your head? You were think, dusting under your bed. Well, I'm just an animal person, you know. I know, but there's bunnies and dust bunnies are... Well, I wanted, I wanted a little character that was a contradiction um, because people think of bunnies as harmless. Cute. And, yeah. and, um, and I, so the surprise is that these are predators. They're, they're, little pre they're like a little dog or something. They're more of a predator. So I wanted, I wanted a, an animal that, that the name embodied that conflict of what you see is not what you get kind of thing. Brilliant. Yeah. Really brilliant. You, you can have someone commented that they they love how you started adding a couple pages at the end of the book about what the dust bunnies are doing. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I told you they've taken over the series. I was like, <laughs> ah. so that's um, yeah, it's just I, 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 hem, I hesitate to ever do character animals where the animal thinks in, you know that I'm inside the animal's head because I don't believe in anthropomorphizing <laughs> whatever that thing is where you pretend they're like humans um but with the dust buddies that's I feel free to do it it's you know it's like yeah I can do whatever I want with them and so so I don't ever go inside their heads like what they're thinking I just show what they're doing in their own world and do you have a favorite dust bunny no just like the one I wrote last <laughs> the, hard part about, the hard part about dust bunnies is giving each one a unique uh, personality. And the second hard part is coming up with a name. <laughs> oh. I'm thinking of Otto for the next one. Uh, Otis. 
Otis. I think I'll go with Otis. Otis is good. Otis is good, yeah. Oh. It's a respectable name. <laughs> respectable that's funny. <laughs> Let's see. I'm not seeing any more Facebook questions. You're bored with this already, Jane. Get the hook. <laughs> well, then I'll ask one of my questions. So, what is your favorite library memory? I go first. Okay. So I grew up in, I've got two of them. I grew up in Lancaster, Ohio, and the white and the um, library was in the courthouse. Oh, I got four. Sorry, Jane. And um, I, I remember just being little and the steps were marble courthouse steps inside the building. The library's on the second floor and the steps had these little dents in them. And about, oh, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I went back, hadn't been there in 30, 40 years. And the steps were still there. The library was gone, but the same, the steps were still there. That was a wonderful memory. And um, one of my other memories that I loved is when uh, our, I had a three and a half year old and a newborn. And it was when I was working on my very first book. So of course, no internet then living at the library. And I would put this little newborn in and go into the library with him. So he was growing up in that library. When he went, when he got to be about three and a half, this is my son, Zach, he um, developed this obsession with records. And he would, the, the children's library had a low table with a big box of records on the top. And he would go in there and the minute I released him, he would barrel over there, climb up on the table and start with the records. So it got to the point where the librarians, they were so dear, they'd see us coming in and they'd say, hi, Susan, hi, Zach. And they would go over, take the record box and put it up on a high shelf where he couldn't put it. <laughs> I, you know, I spent so much of my life in libraries. It's just America's greatest treasure, our public library system. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, I, as you know, am a former librarian. I don't think there are any ex-librarians, just like there are no ex-Marines. <laughs> um, but, but probably the memory that will stick with me the most was my one year as a uh, elementary school librarian. And I remember, <laughs> I remember standing up there in this well-equipped elementary school library and watching the latest class, because we had a series of classes, you know, second grade would come through, third grade would come through, fourth grade would come through. <laughs> watching this class of second graders tear the library apart, <laughs> running all over the place. And I had absolutely zero control over this class. <laughs> I, and I said to myself, Jane, you were not meant to teach. <laughs> this is, you were not meant to run a high school or a school library of any kind. You could find another career path here. So I wound up in <laughs> libraries for the most part, which was actually very boring work. Mm. I don't recommend corporate libraries, uh, at least not the ones I worked in. But, uh, but that year as a, as a school librarian, boy, did I come out of that with an appreciation for those who got the gift of being able to teach. Man, mm. is that a, a talent? And I say, you pay them. CEO salaries and you get the best because there is nothing as valuable in our society when it comes to children, aside from the parents, as a teacher who really has the gift. Yeah, I would agree. Did you spend a lot of time in libraries as a child, Jane? Yeah, we actually, um, we lived in a very poor county in California and we didn't have a library in, in, our, air, in our community. Um, we had the bookmobile. Oh. Can I tell my bookmobile story? I know we're running out of time here. I'll tell my bookmobile. So when I was, um, e I think, 11 years old, um, we lived in Lancaster, Ohio, and I couldn't, my parents couldn't, the library wasn't walkable. And so I always had to wait for my parents to take me to the library. And I was such a big reader that I would run out of books. And I found out that there was a bookmobile, but it didn't come to our street. So I complained to my father, we, everybody else has a bookmobile, we don't. And my father in typical fashion said, well, get a petition together and get out there and get one. And he showed me how to do a petition. And my friend and I went out door to door and we oh got everybody gosh. to find the petition and we got our bookmobile. Yay. <laughs> that was a great story. It also was a great story. It was great parenting on my father's part yeah, in terms of take was. leadership. Don't just complain, get out there and do something. Yeah. Good lesson. Good lesson. Well, I will always be grateful for that book, uh, bookmobile. That's 
that's for sure. Yeah. I bet the librarians loved getting that petition. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. Um, did you, you love being did you wanted? Did you, the, did you get the bookmobile? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't tell you that part. Yeah, we got the bookmobile right away. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. He did the same thing to me when I started at a new junior high that didn't have a um, school newspaper. <laughs> Go start one. So I went to the teacher and I said, let's start a school newspaper and I'll be the editor. <laughs> we did. <laughs> so it looks like we had another Facebook question come in. Do you still have any of your childhood books? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, um, part, mostly because they were mostly borrowed. I had to give them back to them. <laughs> um, but I think we've just moved so many times that I just, yeah. yeah. There was a series that they sold door to door called the Book House Books. There were 12 volumes. And the book that they sold it on to parents was this book one with all the nursery rhymes and the beautiful coloring. And then the parents would pay for it every month, but they didn't know that by the time you got to book three, all the illustrations were ugly. Uh, and I still have all my book house books. <laughs> okay, well, I have my closing questions, which are the typical, what's next for you? Oh, Jane, you talk about it because I'm not going to. She's, she's keeping mum. Um, Don't I, you blow it like you did last time. <laughs> just <blank. laughs> luckily, luckily, nobody remembers. Um, well, I will be, am actually, because, because the books are usually, because of the timing and writing and publishing, I'm usually, when this book comes out, for example, I am now writing the sequel that will come out at this time next year. So that's, I'm writing the, the the, the next book in this Burning Cove series. Is it the sister? Yeah. Do I know this? Is it the sister? Yeah, the sister. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, but in terms of what will actually be out next that readers can pick up will be in January 1st or thereabouts, which is um, the next book in a contemporary trilogy that I'm doing under my Krentz name. And it's called All the Colors of Night. Oh, cannot wait. And that's and, got a real psychic vibe to it. So. Yeah, that's going to be fun. And I am almost done with the next project. And I'll probably be talking about it in the next month or so, but not quite yet. Perfect. And I think readers know where to find you. But if you want to share where readers can find you. I'm at SusanElizabethPhillips.com. But um, I'm most active on Facebook. And um, also on Instagram at SEP Author. And I suck at Twitter. And I'm at Jane Ann Krentz, no e on the Ann, dot com, and probably mostly on Facebook. But my website is the place to go if you want to find a yeah. list of my books that are sorted by series or chronological. I love that list. Yeah, yeah it's it's the librarian in me. <laughs> yeah, I have that on my website too. Yeah. Wonderful. So we're going to close it up. Thank you again for joining us. And thank you so much to our wonderful authors, Susan and Jane, for spending time with me and everyone else today. You can purchase books by the authors from the Ripped Bodice Bookstore at www.theripped.bodice.la.com. You can also check out the books by the authors um, from the library in print or digitally with Libby, Overdrive, Hoopla, and Cloud Library. If you're interested in more free online programming like this, don't forget to check out our calendar on the website at www.escondidolibrary.org to see the full list of all of our digital programs. And I hope to see you again on Friday, June 26th here on Facebook for our next virtual author chat featuring authors Sonali Dev and Suzanne Park. We'll be discussing diversity, representation, and chatting about their newest releases. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you next time. Thanks, Jessica. Bye-bye. Jessica.